Welcome to Story Talk, a roundtable discussion of a single story at a time. Story Talk is a production of One Week Critique, an Iowa-based arts and education nonprofit that offers educational resources and editorial support to students and teachers of the literary arts. You can learn more about us and our programs or support our work by visiting our Patreon page or by going to our website, oneweekcritique.com. That's the number one weekcritique.com. I'm Adam Alsergani. Here today with Matthew Schmidt. Hello. And Ingrid Wensler. Hey there. Today we'll be discussing Dr. H.A. Moynihan from Manual for Cleaning Women, Selected Stories by Lucia Berlin, published in 2015 by Picador Press. Set in Texas, Dr. H.A. Moynihan is told by a woman reflecting on the summer she was relegated to her alcoholic grandfather's dentist office as ostensible punishment for striking a nun at her Catholic school. In the background of the story, the narrator's grandmother is dying, while in more or less the foreground, both her grandfather, the titular Dr. Moynihan, and her mother slip into worsening addiction and work out their angers at people of color, at each other, and at the world. Uh, that's all info that's established surprisingly early on. And I'd prefer not to overshare because I wanna let the two of you explore the images and the development of the story more thoroughly yourselves. Um, but is there anything essential that's missing uh, for listeners before we dive in? No, I think that uh, pretty well covers it. I agree. Cool. Uh, so I'd heard of Lucy Berlin loosely, but um, I hadn't really uh, gotten in touch with her work until an interviewee of mine uh, Elizabeth Jehagen, uh, who was a student of Berlin's, uh, mentioned her to me. Um, and she particularly had, had told me that uh, Lucia Berlin had uh, lived in the same apartment as Denise Levertov um, in New York at one point, and they were friends. Um, I wrongheadedly then imagined that Berlin was going to be Levertov esque. Um, mm -hmm. She is not. <laughs> um, uh, Though I'd recommend both of them. Uh, that's a kind of silly lead in to tell my own history <laughs> with this author. Um, Levertov is a poet um, or primarily a poet um, while Berlin is a short story writer. But the thing that strikes me most about Berlin and that sort of differentiates her from Levertov or frankly anyone else uh, is her voice. Um, to me, it's strident, it's smooth, but it's sharp. Um, it's conversational, but um, I wrote down eloquently idiosyncratic. Uh, this story, I think, is a kind of fair to middling representation of that voice. Um, and I say all that to ask uh, this little question, which is, what is Berlin's voice like in Dr. H.A. Moynihan? And how does it move? Well, I think that that question actually gets me thinking um, sort of more broadly about what we mean when we talk about voice, um, sure. uh, the voice of a particular character or a story's voice. And, you know, I think just generalizing here, the term voice um, tends to encompass like actually like a ton of things, tone, register, perspective, how this voice has been shaped by class, by race, um, by what the holder has and hasn't seen in the world, um, by regional proclivities, like does this voice use a lot of phrases or expressions particular to the rural Midwest? Um, you know, I, I could go on, which is all to say, um, I think voice is a little bit of a catch-all term in fiction. Um, and has come perhaps to be a catch-all term because there's so much we've learned to sort of intuit um, and communicate like tacitly or indirectly about voice, um, which, you know, is the long way around the barn of saying um, that Adam, yeah, I think, I think the adjectives you choose to describe her voice um, feel just right me um strident smooth but sharp especially it feels really right 
Um, and, you know, I, I have to think, I, I have to sit and think back about like why I feel that's so right as a reader. And, you know, I think there are a few instances where I, I know that Berlin does something like place a short sentence without any subordinate clauses before or after a longer sentence. Um, and I think what you're sensing rightly, Adam, is that in another writer's hand, this could be sort of jarring where Rita is sharp but not smooth. Um, but I think the force of this voice and its kind of naturalness and unassuming intelligence sort of holds together sentences that don't so easily fit. Does that make sense? Oh, totally, totally. Yeah, uh, I think one way I'm thinking about voice in this is in respect to the, the narrator uh, kind of trying to figure out who she is um, insofar as, right, she's living in a house with her mother, her grandmother, and her grandfather. And everyone's kind of on their own trip at this moment. Uh, grandma, because she's dying. Um, but the other two really don't talk to each other. And so our narrator kind of gets information by watching and by listening. And so some of like the way it moves is like from kind of thought to thought. It's like, oh, this made me think of this. I wouldn't call it stream of consciousness though. Um, I would call it more like uh, I'm trying to understand the position I am in, in this life. Mm -hmm. And these things are making me think about these related things. Yeah, I think that that's, you know, the two of you know this about me, but I've been obsessing about this book a little bit lately for a lot of reasons, um, including the fact that, right, like this is a selected Berlin that was published posthumously um, and is, I think, edited together in a way that's meant to make it more coherent. I know I'd sort of messed up by sending the two of you a version that was an earlier version of the book and I spent forever trying to track down because of Berlin's often sort of limited and sporadic publications, uh, had a hard time tracking down the process of this story. Um, but one thing I've kind of garnered from doing that is seeing that a lot of her stories have that, that kind of swiftness of voice to your point, Ingrid, that kind of the hypotactic mixed with short, punctuated sentences that move and that often feel told to you, which is something that I really admire about her work, that I feel like I'm being told a story. Um, I know you both also know I've been obsessing over Walter Benjamin, who uh, takes storytelling back to that, um, that origin and thinks out a lot about what the role of the storyteller is in communication as someone who speaks to you and who interacts with you. Um, and I think there's something about Berlin and uh, in the introduction to Manual for Cleaning Women, um, uh, Lydia Davis actually talks quite a bit about Berlin's use of her own biography as a way to structure stories, even where that biography is obscured or isn't entirely accurate. And it does, I think it, there's some kind of magic there that I'm trying to, to grasp um, as to how she, how she hits on something. And it is that this thought led me to this thought that makes me feel like I'm a second person in the room or like I've asked a question that's getting fleshed out a little bit by the way that she's speaking through it. Yeah, one, one example I was going to bring up here, uh, this is on the second page of the story. Uh, quote, he was the best dentist in West Texas, maybe in all of Texas, speaking of her grandfather. Many people said so, and I believed it. It wasn't true that his patients were old, all old winos or Mammy's friends. 
My mother said that. Distinguished men came even from Dallas or Houston because he made such wonderful false teeth. Right, so we get punctuations of her thought within that, but also mom told me that this is true, right? And then she carries on as if like, it is definitely a truth and takes it past that point of her mother's truth to something she believes is actually true. We don't get that information of like how she knows these distinguished men are coming from Dallas or Houston, but since she's working in the office, she's listening to these, uh, these people talk about like business or whatever, you know, um, nonetheless, like there is a sort of obfuscation going on here to us, the reader, but only insofar as she's trying to tell us the story as directly as she can, but can only tell it directly using multiple sources of information. Yeah. Which feels true to like familial narrative, right? Like really, really <laughs> accurate to that experience for me. Right. Um, so to that end, right, like I think another part of that effect is that you get these very specific kinds of images um, and these details, right? Including the kind of journalistic citing of sources that is actually family citing, right? Um, and for that, right, like we're in Texas, but the story kind of lacks space. And I, you know, I say lacks space, but I don't think that's a bad thing, right? Like it's a story that has sort of like Calvino's kind of real lightness about it. And it seems to me to achieve that by leaving, you know, it's like a stage set where there's a limited number of objects to cue you to where you're at. Um, so that the objects or the images have room to move and be focused on. Um, I wondered if you two could lay out the space a little bit for us. Can you tell us about the community that this girl's in, the home that she's in, the dentist office, which has some <laughs> amazing details <laughs> about it um, as they're presented here? Yeah, um, so... West Texas, uh, specifically El Paso, uh, is, is the location. And we're not exactly certain where the house is located at within the city, uh, but the dental office is off of the main street in El Paso. Um, as far as the house goes, I feel like that is the least kind of explored portion of the spaces. Uh, mostly because I don't understand the setup of the house yeah. and that's fine. Like I don't need to understand the setup of the house. What we know is that grandma's dying in one room. Grandpa has a room that he drinks himself to sleep in. Mom has a room she drinks herself to sleep in and our narrator sleeps on the porch. So maybe not a big house, but uh, somewhere in the city because uh, grandpa generally calls a taxi to take him to work. Um, as far as this, the dental uh, space goes, this is more clear and yet also more amorphous in my mind because it's, it's in a building somewhere downtown off the main street. And we know it's at least five stories high well, at least six stories high, uh, based on descriptions in the book. Yeah. The thing that you know maybe trips me up the most is whether or not you know the bottom of the building is beneath like a hill or a rise that the top of the building is on, because they have to take an elevator to get up to the office. And yet the windows from that particular office look out on Main Street, right? So I'm not saying that that's not true. I'm saying it's an unusual thing, though I've been in buildings like that. Yeah. Um, but we don't like get that sort of information. Yeah. We get more of the dental office, which is a very strange place because the waiting room and the operating room 
are in the same room, basically. There, there's no wall. And we get descriptions of grandpa uh, with a drill in hand, turning around to talk to the people in the waiting room, uh, either as they're recovering from having their teeth pulled or from uh, waiting to have their turn uh, in the chair. <laughs> he also has uh, a workroom and an office that no one's allowed into where he makes sets of false teeth. Uh, he has all of his equipment um, and then an office where he's got a desk and uh, you know, he, he writes checks there and he also has apparently an extraordinary collection of newspaper and magazine clippings that he pastes into notebooks of some sort, <laughs> scrapbooks, I don't know. Uh, and, and, and he has this on, on some very bizarre things, uh, particularly Ernie Pyle and FDR uh, surrounding the quote, Japanese and German wars. And quote, he had scrapbooks for crime in Texas and freak accidents. <laughs> I knew you would like that. Oh, my favorite, <laughs> my favorite part comes right after that because it gives an example of one of the freak accidents. And that is, quote, man gets mad and throws a watermelon out of a second story window. It hits his wife on the head and kills her, bounces off, hits the baby in the buggy, kills it too, and doesn't even break. <laughs> Now, let me just say, that is an amazing, <laughs> amazing description. <laughs> and, you know, it makes me, I, I, was, I was once a newspaper carrier. <laughs> and so I had access to all the newspapers all the time. And believe it or not, there are stories like that <laughs> all the time. And, and, it, and it's crazy because, like, it's interesting that the thing has happened. It's interesting that we're so invested in thinking through those things, but it doesn't like lay out any background whatsoever <laughs> on like how this man gets mad at the watermelon, like who he is, what his wife is doing, who the baby is, you know, like why, through the <laughs> why he throws it out the window. Right. So, so there's, we get this bizarre sense about grandpa. Um, he has two safes uh, in the waiting room. Uh, and on the safes, he's got like little Buddha figures. He's got uh, crocodiles that if you pull their tails, they bite you. Or is it snakes? I don't know. It's some reptile. Snakes, I think. Yeah, snakes maybe. Um, anyway, he's got all these weird things. And then in the safe, he has gold and silver for fillings, piles of money, and bottles of Jack Daniels. <laughs> And he's basically constantly drinking and maybe doing some other things uh, or at least like getting some residual glue huffing into his day. <laughs> right. So he's he's kind of he's far out there, but he does such an amazing job on uh, creating false teeth uh, that everyone comes to him. And he kind of lives in a a dump because his workshop is just like it's just got materials and mess everywhere um and even his desk like he's he splatters ink when he writes with his fountain pen yeah right so so we've got all of that happening so we know it's set sometime uh at least i don't know exactly what the time frame would be but I'm thinking it's at least, you know, like 40s, yeah, maybe 1940s, 1950s. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense because FDR is in the national news or he's in Texas news. Ernie Pyle exists as a character. <laughs> so, like, right. Know, but like, yeah, um, it's wild. It's wild. Sorry for laughing so hard. <laughs> uh, there's something about the absurdism that's like quiet and underneath all the dark shit happening. Yeah. <laughs> that kills me. Uh, yeah, I think I think Berlin has a real gift for treating setting in particular. And, um, you know, I mean, I think one thing that's unusual about this story is you do have like 
this very spare setting where you know very little about El Paso and what's surrounding these spaces. You actually know very little, as Matthew pointed out, about the home structure. Um, and in a way, like, without ever feeling like, you know, the story's skimping on details or so stripped down that it's only giving you, like, what you need in this very, like, economical kind of way, it does in this very actually sort of gentle way um, often point you to the things that you should be paying attention to in terms of setting. So, I mean, in a way it's saying like, El Paso is the greater backdrop, but don't really bother with El Paso as a reader. Um, I bother with this strange office and, you know, the gold and silver in the safe and um, the Buddha on top of it and the, false teeth wired to open and close and the snake that bites you if you pull its tail. And that's so closely in line with what this narrator would be perceiving about space, I think, you know, I mean, she's a young kid. She's not gonna be thinking about El Paso and like the cityscape. In fact, like she's not going to many parts of El Paso. She's staying close to home and to this office. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think that also relates to like the sort of information that we get about what's allowed and what's disallowed. Um, I think that's actually crucial to some of the work that Berlin's doing around setting um, you know, the narrator is aware that there are children playing outside her house and pays special attention to them because she's not allowed to play with them. Um, so her space is sort of curtailed in that way, but she has a fascination nonetheless for those children when they're playing. One of my favorite lines in the story is um, about Mexican kids playing outside that the narrator aches to play with. And she describes she says of the jacks um, that they're playing with, the sound of the jacks was magical to me. The toss of the jacks like brushes on a drum or like rain when a gust of wind shimmers it against the window pane. Um, some of why I love that is, you know, I mean, I think it gets across like the narrator's longing and the kind of attention she pays to things when she's longing. Yeah. Um, and it's also a break from the usual rhythm of the voice. I think if it were all that lyrical, that line wouldn't shimmer in the way that it does, but it sort of feels like something that's held in reserve and like a secret that's shared. Um, I think in terms of other spaces that are disallowed, you have um, the um the narrator's grandpa is described as being racist and bigoted and he, he won't serve Negroes. There's a sign on his office that says that. Um, so, you know, you have a sense of who's allowed, where and who's not. Um, the narrator is also not allowed in his workshop, and, you know, nor is anyone else until a certain point in the story. And, you know, she sneaks into the workshop and gives us the layout of the workshop as well. I, I may be mixing up versions there. I don't know if that's in the second version, but yeah, yeah, um, in one of Berlin's versions, anyway, that that space is forbidden and the narrator goes in anyway, kind of checks it out. Um, well, she checks it out when, when grandpa's in the bathroom. And, you know, one can only imagine what grandpa's doing in the bathroom for so long that she has time to go check that out. Either he's, you know, using the facilities because he's been drinking constantly uh, or he's vomiting or he's doing something else that one would probably call uncouth to do at work. Indeed. <laughs> Thanks for that, Matthew. You bet. <laughs> Just you know, I mean, I think another crucial thing is in terms of the house and the separate rooms that we get to, one of the first details we get about the house before understanding anything about grandpa's and uh, his daughter, the narrator's mother's relationship, we understand that they're, they're in separate rooms and drinking in those separate rooms. And 
I love the way that lays, that we get that first and then find out that, you know, they don't get along and that they don't, they don't speak. Um, that makes perfect sense. That's kind of what I assume, but I like it that I'm sort of led into what's normal for the narrator first, and then we end up moving to why that's normal. For sure. Um, speaking of uh, drinking in separate rooms, which is a, a weird, sad detail to me. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think drinking alone in the same house with someone else drinking alone somehow is one of the more bummer portrayals of uh, alcoholism uh, that I've read in a while. Um, and there are plenty of bummer portrayals of alcoholism in Berlin. Uh, but uh, let's talk a little bit about the characters represented in the story, right? Like, who exist in all that space and amongst all that stuff. Um, how do the, in particular, I'm interested in, right, we've talked a little bit about the mother, Dr. Moynihan, the narrator, there's also grandma in the background, or Mammy, um, who's dying in the background. Um, and then, you know, various sort of odds and ends characters throughout the story. Um, I'm interested in how those folks influence the pressure and tension of the plot in part because, right, like for me, there's this relationship between that voicey kind of speech that told storytelling um, and the characters that are being told about against the backdrop of, of jacks and toy snakes and Buddhas and, and teeth plaster. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the ones that maybe stand out the most to me are uh, Mammy's friends who are constantly in the house praying, singing, you know, uh, we don't know exactly how many friends there are, but it seems to be a constant vigil uh, for Mammy. And, you know, we don't spend a lot of time with those people other than to know that not only is this small house have at least three rooms and a porch, but somewhere, you know, in, in Mammy's room or like just outside Mammy's room, there's like a whole group of people like trying to will her back to life through religion. Um, right. So there's this, it's a very strange, like carnival happening in, in the house uh, at all times. And, you know, it's hard to understand how anyone sleeps other than drinking themselves to sleep or, uh, you know, Mammy who's on morphine in order to be able to sleep at all, um, right? And, you know, one of, one of the details uh, that makes, that helps make a little bit more sense, I think of why uh, the narrator's mother and grandfather uh, don't speak uh, is that the book tells us, or the narrator tells us, he was cruel and bigoted and proud. He had shot my uncle John's eye out during a quarrel and had shamed and humiliated my mother all her life. She wouldn't speak to him, wouldn't even get near him because he was so filthy, slopping food and spitting leaving wet cigarettes everywhere, right? So he's, he's this, he's like a caricature except real, right? And so it's like all the things you don't want to be around, right, are, are the narrator's grandfather. And, you know, it's not exactly specific why he's so cruel to her mother, uh, we can make speculations on that. Um, but all of the things he has done to get to this point when the story is told, uh, keep her mother and grandfather separated. Um, as far as other people go, uh, 
we do have Jim, the elevator operator, who is the only black person in the hotel, in the, not the hotel, in the building where the dental office is. Uh, we have neighbors uh, who are Mexican and Syrian. Uh, Ingrid's talked about a lot of the uh, Jack playing children uh, outside. Uh, and of course, uh, supposedly the narrator can't play with him because they are not white. Yeah. Uh, and, and so there's that that's constantly intruding upon uh, the story. And, you know, we have all of these dental patients that are coming in. And while we don't necessarily get so much about the dental patients, we indirectly get what the dental patients have to deal with, which is there really aren't any chairs in the waiting room. So they're just sitting on windowsills and radiators. Uh, there's a phone booth in there. Sometimes people sit in the phone booth. Uh, on the ceiling, there's a sign that says, what the hell are you doing looking up here? Right, so there's all these, like, it's like a fun house of absurdity that these people are coming to the grandfather because he makes teeth uh, that, that last so long. They don't whistle, you know, they don't fall out. They're, they're you know, so <laughs> particular to the person's mouth that they will come from all over Texas to get these false teeth put in. Which, you know, in, in the 50s or 40s, which presumably it is, um, is El Paso's not the easiest place to get to from those places, I would assume. It's kind of an odd location in Texas to have to come. Um, you seem to be thinking something. Um, well, I, I'm doubtful of that, actually. Okay. Um, yeah. It's possible. I, I feel like maybe... El Paso was more central for West Texas, at least. Um, you know, probably not too rural relative to other spaces there. But um, I, I don't know, I'm not <laughs> a Texas expert here. Um, I, I guess I would say, Matthew, I think you're, you're smartly pointing us to some of the background characters that do like introduce a little bit of tension in the story. Um, you know, I mean, even very minor characters, like because the Mexican children outside are, are children that she's not allowed to play with, at, as are the Syrian children. Um, you know, th their very presence is like something that's not allowed again. Um, you know, Jim, the elevator operator, a very small character, finally, like in terms of his role in the story, um, is again in a building where like, the grandfather isn't serving Negroes. Um, so, I mean, that of course creates a little bit of friction. Like, how is grandpa going to treat the elevator operator? Yeah. Um, you wonder these things and, you know, what sparks are going to strike. <laughs> um, in terms of Mammy's friends um, in the house, um, you know, Mammy as a character in this story kind of reminds me of um, the mother and as I lay dying, you know, the whole, that whole um, book of Faulkner's is about burying a character um, who, and, you know, I mean, the mission is all about that. Um, and that character is not very known, largely absent from the story. Um, Mammy is that kind of presence to me that like, we don't know much about her other than that she's in pain and dying. Um, but that she's in pain adds a certain states to the story. And, you know, she's, she's this person that, the narr that has brought these characters together in a, in a sense. And, and, you know, who binds them, but who, who we don't know much about. Um, and I, I, I think Mama is an, a really fascinating character in this story as well. I mean, most of what we know about her is that she doesn't get along with Grandpa. Um, 
and um, that she's drinking quite a bit herself as her mother's dying. Um, she says she's going out to play bridge and comes back drunk, um, the narrator observes. Um, she doesn't seem to understand what happens at the climax of the story so well. And I mean, I'd be flustered too. I, I don't know if that's, um, you know, good evidence that she's an unreliable character, but, um, you know, the, the, the tension that's there between her and grandpa adds, adds something too. Um, so, I mean, in a way, <laughs> I'll, I'll talk a little more about this later, but the climax um, fits the story perfectly, I think. Um, but in a way, like, as I'm reading the story the entire time, I'm sort of expecting something to go awry, something to kind of blow up. And I don't know what it's going to be. And it's not that everything feels so loaded. It's just that there are all these little details that point to friction at a yeah. low level. Oh, totally. I think the one thing about the way that is a sense of tension and a sense of sort of atmosphere that does have a lot of, I don't know if it's sinister, it's just like low key. Well, I mean, one thing about the story is I, I think the narrator's voice and how funny the scene details are and just how dry and funny and matter of fact the voices ends up tempering a lot of that tension so like I'm kind of on guard as a reader but I'm also having such a great time that it's hard to be too too yeah. worried about what's going to happen at the end. oh for sure um so I'm going to let the cat out of the bag uh, with regard <laughs> to that climax uh, a good portion uh, maybe the better portion of the story is dedicated to more or less a single long scene in which Dr. Moynihan has his granddaughter pull all of his teeth um, without giving her any warning that that's what she's coming to do. Uh, I'd like to hold off on discussing that scene too much for a moment to ask first how a little bit more about how we get to that climax, the sort of propulsion forward out of that, how you get, uh, Ang, as you mentioned, sort of lulled into that humor. Um, and what does that kind of lulling and that preparation do? What does it tell us as readers about this girl and her family and about Texas at that time and, and sort of what we're, right, what we're prepared for and what we're unprepared for and, and how sort of realizing that a lot of this story is a build up to this teeth pulling situation or that that teeth pulling situation is sort of the explosion out of all of this little powder kegging works. It's not my best verbing of a noun, powder kegging. Do you want me to start here, Matthew? See. Oh, okay. Um, well, I, I think I, you know, I mean what I say when, when I say that the climax that we come to, this, you know, dramatic pulling of all, all of Grandpa's teeth, um, doesn't feel inevitable to me in the story, and, um, it doesn't feel, like, faded, I guess, um, but it doesn't feel improbable in the story either. Um, I, I think it's important that like, the narrator doesn't find out that this is happening until it's happening. But some of why this feels the way it does. I mean, I think the way the story lays the groundwork is you know, we start out with Grandpa's profession. He is a dentist. He's you know, um, supposedly the best dentist in West Texas. Um, we get a lot of details early on about his work making these false teeth. Um, and I mean, even his like sort of philosophy around the false teeth, um, that they're not false teeth that are, are meant to look whiter and brighter than their actual teeth. They're, they're authentic, they're realistic. 
that's his artistry and that's how he approaches things. Um, but they're also practically the ones with the soul. You know, uh, Grandpa from the beginning of the story is doing a lot of drinking also in his office. He's a fiercely independent character and the kind of character who seems like he would rely on, you know, only maybe an intimate or a family member in this situation. He doesn't seem like someone who's going to go to another dentist and do this in a very formal way. He's, he's kind of like this fiery like maverick of a character. So um, like this doesn't feel improbable in that way. And, you know, I think, well, I, I guess I'll, I'll just say that for now, that I, I think, um, I think it makes sense that given what these characters are going through with this, but they've all been brought together that like in a way that the climax wouldn't be something to do with Manny. Like Manny is what they're not talking about, what they're all avoiding. Um, that instead they would, you know, end up doing something preposterous given the, the personalities in the books. Yeah, I think, um, no, I think that's a really good description of that, right? Like that, there's sort of an anticipation built out of the small abnormalities that like allow you to in that kind of like watching a like crime documentary sort of way like you can look back and say he was always a little strange uh about it um in the way that i'm sure listeners will say something was bound to go wrong in this podcast hearing the dog whine and the <laughs> at the ambulance running in the background. Um, but I, Maddie, I know you had some thoughts about like some of the other kind of ways in which that tension gets built. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think a couple of things, I guess the, the first thing being, uh, you know, when you're in, when the majority of the adults in a given situation are not in sober headspace, things are bound to get wild. Uh, and, you know, this is like a look at depravity on a certain level that's maybe deeper than uh, one would hope a child would be, uh, you know, growing up in. Yeah. But also, <clears throat> I think we're we're very clearly meant to understand that punishment is warranted. Um, and And I think some of that is is punishment for our narrator who has hit a nun. And some of that is punishment that the family is inflicting on itself for their choices. And, you know, I, I, I think there can be some different reads on that and not everyone will probably agree with that particular assessment, but there is a particular self-hatred going on when people are just drunk all the time. Yeah. And, you know, grandpa is in some ways like teaching his granddaughter that the world is a messy, strange, bloody place. And you better get used to it. If you're not already like, this is, this is what's going to happen. Yeah. I think that's, I mean, it's a really horrifying lesson, right? Not only because the world is way scarier as an adult than it is as a child for for many people but also because these adults are propagating the danger in that way and i think interestingly uh, one thing for me is it's compelling is 
it's, I think a lot of folks I know who are extremely talented struggle with alcoholism for various reasons. Um, and that combination of, I can do this, this is easy for me, therefore you should be able to do it or metaphorically take the wheel um, in this situation. Um, that kind of logic feels coherent to me. Um, and then of course, right, like watching that explode becomes terrifying. I think you're hitting on something really right about that. Both of you are hitting something really right about my experience of that, of like being lulled into experiencing the world and even knowing what we're sort of leading up to, like laughing at the absurdity of the office and, you know, like, like dismissing as sort of like period um, some of the like problematic like behavior and thinking or like what have you and then like suddenly being there right and it's extremely filmic when we're there which makes it so much worse in some ways um, I'm eager to to explore the, the visual images of that and how they operate in this story especially at this moment. Uh, so can we get into that more like fully, uh, would you two lay out that long teeth pulling scene and it's kind of broad strokes. And I, I guess I'd like to imagine it like, this is sort of one long shot in its own way. I can imagine that being one long shot and it's claustrophobic for that. How does it unfold? Yeah, I mean, I think we're we're told that it's going to be a, a a very crazy experience because you know, grandpa wakes up granddaughter while it's still dark out and calls the cab and goes down to uh pull his own teeth on a Sunday morning. Um the Lord's Day, you might say. The Lord's Day, you might say. And, you know, he, he drives the elevator up because Jim doesn't work on Sundays. And he is, is it's said he, he drove the elevator, maniacally crashing up <laughs> and then down and up again until we finally stopped above the flip, the fifth floor and jumped down. Right. So he's already just like driving this story off the rails or like driving his life off the rails. And, you know, they go into the workshop and he lights a couple of Bunsen burners and, you know, shows granddaughter. Which are all that light the workshop. Yeah, right. So it's dark with some Bunsen burners. And he like shows granddaughter the teeth he has prepared for his own mouth <laughs> based on some, uh, you know, uh, what do they call those? Um, casts? Yeah, like basically casts of his own teeth. And, you know, he has the granddaughter look at them and then opens his mouth and like forces her to look in his mouth and then at the teeth and then in his mouth and then at the teeth. And she's like, oh, they're yours. And, you know, he's, he's very proud of this new cast that he's made of his teeth uh, because he thinks it's a work of art. He's changed one of the front teeth to put a gold cap on it. Um, and he goes, pretty dang good, eh? Well, is it my masterpiece? Yes. I shook his hand. I was very happy to be there, right? And so he basically then walks her through a series of preparations to help him extract his own teeth, which as far as we know, are fine. We don't know that anything is wrong with him. We don't know exactly how old grandpa is either. And so yeah. like, she's preparing a sterilizer, she's preparing, um, you know, some cups of, uh, I can't remember what that's called. 
Yeah, it's. Oh, um, it's. Um, I, I don't know how to pronounce it, but Storm the Septime. Yeah, she's getting uh, jars of sm smelling salts. Um, Grandpa, meanwhile, is preparing with his cigarettes and Jack Daniels uh, to begin pulling his own teeth. So he actually is going to be the one that starts pulling his teeth. He has the granddaughter hold up a mirror. So somehow he can see in the dark with the Bunsen burners while he's yanking out his own teeth. And, uh, you know, uh, he's taking the pliers, he's doing that. And the granddaughter, he, he has a granddaughter, uh, like he's in the chair um, and is leaned back. And the granddaughter is on the, the footrest uh, holding this mirror up. And obviously it doesn't go well after a couple of teeth. And uh, grandpa, you know, tells granddaughter to start pulling them out. And she does. And, you know, it's a very like gory scene where she says it sounds like, you know, trees being uprooted from the earth um, for how the teeth are sounding like when they get pulled free of the gums. Grandpa is in and out of consciousness because he's bleeding everywhere and he's in pain and he's drunk. And, you know, uh, at some point, uh, <laughs> she gets all the teeth out and gets off the chair and hits the wrong lever and grandpa swivels around and blood flies all over the, the floor. And, you know, she's trying to soak everything up with a towel and she runs and gets uh, tea bags because that helps soak up the blood. And right. Like she calls mom or she wants to call mom, but she doesn't have a nickel to call mom. Mom happens to call because she's made this elaborate Sunday dinner in the style of grandma. Uh, and her daughter just yells, help, grandpa hangs up, grandpa vomits, right? And like, it's, it's crazy. Like, it is an insane, <laughs> insane scene. I mean, as are all the scenes leading up to it, I can't stress enough, like, how horrifying, but also deeply, deeply funny story is yeah uh, so in my mind there <laughs> out of all, out of all that insanity maybe because right like i have this taxonomic impulse because of the insanity of what's happening um to sort of categorize what's happening and how is it happening and i've I've decided a little arbitrarily that Berlin's using two kinds of images throughout this scene, that she's got sort of symbolic or artful imagery, and then she's got plot moving imagery. And I think there's a permeability between that, right? Like there's Moynihan's fake teeth and how they're presented with the Bunsen burners. Right. Or the way that she describes like the tea bags that she's put in her grandfather's mouth. She's put a lot of them in because she's removing all of the teeth. And she describes them as parade decorations. And then there's there's imagery that is both sort of symbolic and horrifying, but it's also moving time for us, right? Like she's also using rags to sort of sop up the blood so he doesn't sort of choke on it, right? Like Jimi Hendrix style or something, but like you see the blood moving farther down the rag because it's being sopped in. Um, so could we talk about the way those, we, Matthew just laid out a lot of those images. Can we talk about how they're used and, and how they're presented and how they're acting on the story? A little bit. Um, yeah, we jump in. I mean, full disclosure, right? I'm not very good with plot. Um, I don't think about plot. <laughs> in, 
in a usual kind of way. Um, so but this was an interesting question to me because I think I, I think I understand pretty immediately and intuitively what you mean by this kind of categorization. Um, in that, like, actually, I think I think the line Matthew brought up earlier about um, about the um, teeth being like trees is the perfect example of the different kinds of lines that we're getting throughout this climactic scene. So that line is, he began to pull the rest of his bottom teeth without a mirror. The sound was the sound of roots being ripped out like trees being torn from winter ground. Um, to me, I mean, this at once does all move the plot forward, but it does something very different in terms of register. Um, and, you know, I had a therapist once tell me that like sometimes we reach for metaphor when we're uncomfortable and the way that we reach for humor. I think a little bit of that goes on in this scene where we get, um, you know, a beautiful comparison. Like this line is, is beautiful. But if you actually think about it and think about that sound, um, it's also so horrifying. Um, and I mean, in a way worse for the beauty, like the beauty sort of draws you toward it. Um, and I mean, through the metaphor kind of ends up, for me at least, like momentarily tempering um, some of you know, some of the more like gory and graphic um, things that are happening there, but I don't know, it, it almost has this reverse effect where like, I'm drawn in by the metaphor, by the beauty, but then when I think about the comparison, um, it only gets more horrific <laughs> for me. Um, and you know, there, there are a few moments like that. The grandfather's um, lips are described as closing like gray clam shells. Um, often the metaphor will come in the form of something natural like that. But I mean, when I actually think about his lips looking like gray clam shells, <laughs> I, I don't feel better about what's happening. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, Matthew also brought this one up with the, the chair that's when she when she um, hits the wrong lever of the chair and the blood goes spattering in circles um you know at first i'm like oh wow that's that's i mean kind of fascinating like jackson pollock i start to imagine that and i'm like okay oh, this is the man's blood like i can't think about this this way <laughs> um so i i don't think i'm really answering your question about plot and i think in a way what i'm trying to say is um I think, I think there are lines that are a little more about like, here's what happened and here's how it happened. Like the one I read off about um, grandpa just pulling his bottom teeth without a mirror. That's kind of factual, but I actually do think all the imagistic lines are, are moving something forward to um, yeah. sort of telling us something. They're not. No, totally. I think that, I, I think you are hitting on it, right? Like that, that I think that gray clamshell is an image, right? If you, I think I think about this story, as I said, a little bit filmically. So if you're following that image, right? Like, and you're kind of following along that progressive scene of entering the office early in the day and moving through that, that there's, or even like that tree root image, right? If you imagine yeah. that kind of cut away from like the image of like the pulling and the fear of that and that lighting and, you know, metaphor kind of works that way in the mind of the tree being pulled and the sound and the specificity of winter earth as being hard earth. I think all of that's so, um, it's not the only way to tell that, nor is it the only way to move that, but it does, stop us and, and give us something specific to linger with. Yeah, maybe another way of putting it is it's like a more visual way of moving forward the plot, which is why you're reaching for something like filmic that yeah. um, 
you know, we, we don't necessarily need to get the image of his lips as clamshells um, to understand something about what's happened in terms of action. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, it's, it, it's, these images are kept close enough to the action. And, you know, the visual is in a way part of the action that, <laughs> you know, they're, they're not too far apart. Yeah, I kind of think of it as moving between uh, one thing happens and then another thing happens, such as like, I don't know, a Buster Keaton film where like, it seems like they've, they've sped up the film to go through the camera and yet he's like walking slowly and like you can see what's gonna happen next and that it's gonna be painful and then somehow he escapes the painfulness. Yeah. But, you know, instead of escaping the painfulness, like this one just got, kind of goes into humor, right? Like we don't necessarily escape the painfulness, but we're given moments of levity with which to imagine things. So between the splices of Buster Keaton, we get something like a, a Luis Bunuel film where like slicing an eyeball is like the moon. Um, one thing for another thing. And you have to like sit there and look at it. Um, I might also compare it to something that Terrence Malick uh, has done. The three of us recently watched uh, The Tree of Life. Yeah. Imagine how the things are happening. Like there's plot, 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 plot. And then there's an extended like universal uh, creation, like half an hour into the film where you like look at things so closely but you're having to think about the plot of what has happened already and what's to come. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's, it's like that. I think um, it's zaniness, absurdity uh, mixed with beauty and uh, etherealness that like keeps the scene like both moving quickly, but pausing on those things that we, we mentioned, like, the, the trees uh, as a metaphor or the clam, the clam shell like mouth, um, his face as being so horrifying to the granddaughter. Um, and, and like one of, an example of the, the levity is that at one point the granddaughter gets out the smelling salts and wakes him up and he goes, my teeth, he yelled. They're gone, I called, like to a child, all gone. The new ones, fool. I went to get them. I knew them now. They were exactly like his mouth had been inside. Right? So like, it's horrifying. It's funny. But we've got these images already in our head. So we're like looking at it anyway, yeah. while the plot is going around like a comedy. Yeah. Matthew, I think um, there's something about that Malik um, comparison that really feels just right for me. Um, I think the one thing I'd say that is a little different here um, is Berlin manages to do this all with her own like remarkable um, sense of pacing. Um, with Malik, there's this beautiful thing that reminds me of, um, I, I listened to um, this podcast um, BBC's in our time on uh, Mrs. Dalloway once, and one of the um, participants described in Dalloway like it's as if you fall into these pools of consciousness, and time sort of goes away. And I, I think Malik's a little like that, where like the comparison is always live for you. You're always aware of that greater context, and you don't get lost when you fall into those pools, but. The, the time sort of extends yeah. and here like somehow the same thing is going on but you're moving like that 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 <laughs> and um you know i think that just heightens the absurdity <laughs> um if that makes sense yeah i think it's a de there's something about that combination of the, the conversational the sort of swiftness of it that you can i mean you can roll over those images you can roll right past the clamshell or the roots being yeah. mm -hmm. 
or even the parade decorations and it can all just be happening. I think Matthew's image of the sort of Buster Keaton film where like, yeah. you know, you've like cut a couple of the like images mm -hmm. out on the reel in order to make the slow of a pace that, that that's happening while simultaneously, you know, like Malik dealing with something sort of evidently profound. Um, and also like Malik, here's a bad transition. Uh, so Grandpa Dr. Moynihan is an alcoholic. Um, his wife is dying and there are church people constantly praying. His daughter doesn't like him. Uh, but it still seems like an absurdist thing to me uh, and a mortifying thing uh, to do to yourself and to anybody else to, to make a child pull your teeth um, and go through this, especially being someone who pulls teeth and knows what it's going to be. So uh, can we speculate on why the hell this happens? Uh, I mean, I know we talked about it so the lead up and the like conditions, but I still, I think I'm left with that question. I don't have a satisfying answer for myself. Well, I mean, you know, I've said part of it I thought was about teaching his granddaughter certain things, but I think A, he knows he can't pull them all himself and remain conscious. He has to have someone to do it for him. And the only viable option is the granddaughter. He can't rely on anyone else to do it. That's one thing. Uh, number two, I think he thinks he deserves it. And he does. Um, but really, I think he knows he's dying. And he's, he's such an alcoholic and he doesn't trust anybody else. Remember, Ingrid has been talking about the what's allowed and what's not allowed. Like he won't allow just anyone to pull his teeth and he would rather be the orchestrator of this. And the only person he can control is the granddaughter still. Yeah. And, you know, grandma's dying, his wife's dying. He's probably going to die soon. And if he's not going to die soon, he's going to lose the ability to use his hands Right. And so he's going to take care of this while well, he can take care of this and knows he can take care of this uh, before it's too late and someone else has to do it. He knows he's the best at making these false teeth and he's just going to do it himself. And it, it's going to make him happy in a way, knowing that he's going to be in his coffin with a full set of teeth looking amazing with the one gold tooth, his masterpiece right. in his grill. And right. This is all him being like, I know I've, I've done bad things. My time's coming and I'm not, I can't stop this at this point. I'm going to take care of it now. Yeah. Um, I, th I think um, I, I, I don't know quite how to answer this question because I think I think I have suspicions and I'm trying to stay like as close as I can to what I actually see on the page here. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think what what I see about Grandpa early on and throughout is is that he is very independent and private and. Um, you know, I think I think if he could do it all without his granddaughter, he probably would. Yeah. Um, and you know, I mean, I think it kind of gets me thinking about um, you know long stretches of my life where I've been a single person and like I haven't wanted to like ask someone to like help assemble a bed or you know get a ride from a doctor back and the things you do. Um, and who you choose to rely on and when you're used to doing things for yourself and that's how you want to do things. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think, I think that's kind of largely where he's at 
Like Matthew, I, I have a lot of questions around whether his teeth do need to be pulled. Um, that's not clearly on the page. And um, I think I lean toward um, that they don't need to be pulled, that he's not having a medical emergency. The only thing that points me to potentially him like needing them is that he goes in on a Sunday morning in the way that he does. But, you know, I think there are other reasons to do that, that there aren't other patients around. Um, and, you know, there's nothing so unusual about choosing the morning per se. Um, so, I mean, it could, it could be a mixed bag thing of having like one tooth that's bothering him, but not really needing to pull all of them. Um, but I mean, I think mainly he's, he's proud of, of these teeth, like Matthew's saying, and of his work and, you know, whether he's about to die soon or not, like he wants to see how these teeth are going to look in his mouth. <laughs> and he's dragging his granddaughter with him. And I mean, I, I think I, I stand by like my, my sense that he would do this on his own if he could, but I do think it's still significant that he chooses her. And, you know, I mean, now that Matthew and Adam both have mentioned movies, I think I have them on my mind, but um, a title of a movie I really love and I love the movie too is Let the Right One In. And I, I think he chooses to let her into this moment and, you know, not his daughter and not other people he knows. And that is a control thing, but there's also a trust thing there. Um, you know, he knows that she's going to play along with him. And he, he also, you know, wants to show her the teeth and ask her, you know, like, what do you think of them? And play the little game, and, you know, not telling her at first that they're going to be for him um, and ask, like, you know, is this my masterpiece? I think there is a little bit of bonding going on. Like Matthew said, a little bit of training and educating, um, maybe even into dentistry a little bit. And it's you funny. Know, a vulnerability that's shared between those two characters as well. It's funny and telling that you bring up Let the Right One In <laughs> because uh, Grandpa is described in bed, Grandpa slept too. Yeah. His, teeth, his teeth bared in a Bella Lugosi grin. <laughs> Right, so I am so deeply associated in that way. I'm sure my subconscious is up to that. Right, so it's the vampirical aspect of teeth <laughs> right. uh, in blood, right? Like this whole end scene is a vampiric, you know, uh, foray into like, you know, making the next vampire, which is like his granddaughter. You know, that's one way to read it. I think that's probably taking it too far. <laughs> I think so too. However, you know, it is interesting that you bring that up. Okay. Um, I'm really, you know, I think a lot of things about this last scene, I'm interested in the sort of psychology of what's happening, even though I, th I think it's really important to Berlin's story that some of that psychologizing is left off the page and that the actions speak for themselves, um, which is part of, by the way, what gives it some of that filmic quality to me that there isn't like, there isn't a, a monologue or, or too much speculation on it, but all these details have been left there as hints. I think also, right, like this, this mortified me more. I happened to, the day I told the two of you I wanted to do this story, I had to go to the dentist because I was getting a tooth capped and I ended up sitting around with a dental student talking about um, this story and pulling teeth and she was telling me horror stories about people who get aggravated teeth and pull them themselves and mess it up and don't get the roots. And she's also telling me that apparently tea bags really are in some ways antiseptic and are sometimes used to sort of staunch bleeding. That's more of an old school technique, but like uh, that, that happens. So I was you know, sitting with all of those horrifying images in my head. Um, and, you know, like I'd mentioned sort of at the top of our conversation, 
I don't know if uh, Stephen Emerson or um, you know friends or executors of Berlin's estate uh, put this version of the collection together or um, if she'd always built it this way, but there are other allusions and stories with some of these characters um, who appear. And I've tried to leave some of that off because, um, you know, Berlin left this as a self-contained story and it is a self-contained story. Um, but I have a lot of speculations about other allusions and other stories and other um, things that get mentioned about grandpa and his grotesqueness and um, all of that. Um, so, which is my, uh, my teaser to say, go read the rest of this book. Um, <laughs> before we leave though, I think swinging into that bigger world, right? Maybe oddly, the story is told by Dr. Moynihan's granddaughter. It's mostly about the two of them with all of these ancillary characters and, and side bits. Um, but I was hoping that we could end considering the ending a little bit. Um, the ending is actually a statement from the narrator's mother, Dr. Moynihan's daughter, uh, who keeps drinking herself to sleep in a separate room. What happens in that end conversation? Uh, what's it about and, and why why end there when we've started <laughs> with uh, striking a nut? Hey, Matthew, since you have um, the more recent version of this, would you mind reading um, a little bit of the end? Can I put you on sure. the spot in that way? Thanks. Uh, so right after the Bella Lugosi line that I just read, it says, they must have hurt, right? He's got his teeth bared like Bella Lugosi. He's laying in bed. He did a good job, my mother said. You don't still hate him, do you, mama? Oh, yes, she said. Yes, I do. Yeah, so um, for me, um, the ending um, is one of my favorite parts of the story. Um, and, you know, it's a story where it's hard to choose because the images are so wonderful. And, you know, it's, it's just kind of reeling from the start. And, you know, there's so much to love in it. But I think what makes me so fond of this ending is I, I think um, it really, um, in this very quiet way, shows me some of the internal movement that's happening um, through dialogue, which I think is hard to do. Um, I think that narr the narrator's question, like, you don't still hate him, shows us that something's, she feels something has happened here. She thinks that because of what's happened, what grandpa's just done, that her mother's feelings might change. Um, and I think, I think some of what I love about that is I, I think I, I can't, I, I, again, I have like guesses at why the narrator feels that way, that she has been sort of let in, that they've kind of gone through something together, that grandpa's been through something, that he's accomplished something through making these teeth that her mother can't tell the difference between you know, the original teeth and these new teeth. Um, the narrator always seems to be fond of grandpa. I mean, she does have that early like, you know, everybody hates grandpa except mammy and me, I guess. But I, I never trust the I guess too much. Um, she seems to, um, you know, be curious about grandpa from the beginning. And I think what her question tells me is that whatever has happened between them, that it's, it's a big deal to this, to this young narrator. <laughs> and it doesn't surprise me that it's not to her mother in the same way, that her mother's like, when was grandpa done now? <laughs> this place is covered with blood, like she's had, my child pull his teeth. <laughs> um, 
this isn't going to change a grudge and you know bitterness that she's held for a long long time but you know from seeing seeing this so differently through the child's eyes and the mother's very quickly back to back um, i think is really potent well i think the biggest question that maybe we haven't looked at yet is what is the mother doing living in this house with her parents and her daughter? Yeah. And that is not answered in the story, but it, it does tell me that whatever he did was so horrible that she can't stay sober and get away from the family and support herself and her daughter in a way that's, you know, uh, feasible. And so whatever he's done to her is, is so bad that it doesn't matter what he does. He can't atone for it. And, you know, because of the way the story is set up, like, to be honest with you, the easiest answer I have is that uh, he's the father of his granddaughter. And I can't prove that to anyone. There isn't enough information to prove that. However, that is what I finally come to because I can't find another reason uh, for the situation. And it certainly could be that there is a different father out there. Uh, but I don't have information to tell me otherwise. And, you know, no, no matter what amount of atonement is given, you know, it has to be something that's equally bad uh, as something like that in my mind. Um, and that certainly could be, you know, the gift of alcoholism uh, that could certainly be, you know, whatever the reason grandma's dying, uh, that could be taking out her brother's eye in an argument, right? Like all of these things, you know, add up, but, you know, I think it's difficult. It's more difficult for people to get over the thing that has happened to them than it is for them to get over the thing that has happened to others, um, at least in my experience, which is why I land on that particular reading. Um, and it's, and it's it, at the end, what we get is that the mother will finally have the last say in whatever way it's going to be for all we know, grandpa could die from doing this own procedure on himself. Like that's not out of the question at this point. Um, so like, we're literally at the point where like, here's the funeral and here's grandpa and I still won't forgive him. Um, I would be remiss if I did not say that uh, from the get go, we are told that Grandpa knows this about himself. He, he goes by Dr. H.A. Moynihan. And initially, because he is an initials guy, he's literally Dr. Ham. He knows he's ridiculous and has done unforgivable things to many people. And, you know, has no way to get out and so he's he's gone back to the one thing he's good at which is making teeth that are amazing and like that's that's as good as it gets for him yeah yeah i think i'm really interested in both of both of the ways that you guys approach it i think there's something masterful about keeping both valences open that there's all the things that are said on the page right like i can't imagine anybody shoots an eye out in an argument with the intent of just shooting the eye out, right? Like it's a pretty intense thing to do uh, to either your 
son-in-law or your son. <laughs> right, like there are all those other allusions to to how and why people are hurt through the story that the narrator leaves open as the litany of offenses. Um, there's also the fact that like, this is a violent thing to do to a child, right? Is a horrifying traumatic thing to do to a child to surprise them with this kind of activity. Um, and it, I think from an adult perspective is clearly mortifying, right? Like to walk into this like laboratory <laughs> Uh, situation and and also right like there is that notional idea that you're hitting on Matthew that somehow there are things we do in our lives that like if they don't if they aren't direct flagellation for our sins are at least consequential suffering that equates to penance and whatever that is here that my like all of that's happened and this is not only not penance, but it, <laughs> Ingrid's point is so rough that it's evident again, right? Like, but the child does, the child does see it as penance. And I think that the narrator is reaching for something there. Like the child's asking because she doesn't, she knows something about all of those horrible things, but she doesn't know why. <laughs> And I, and I think that mystery at the end really yanks my guts out. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm curious, do, do either of you feel reading this story like it's a little reminiscent of um, the very first story talk we did, um, Alice Munro's The Eye? Oh, man, you know, I hadn't thought about that, but I, I see what you mean on like a kind of intuitive level. Yeah, I'd have to go back again and think about it. But yeah, I know, I would agree. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I guess, I think that why the narrator feels like this is penance is because I think she's constantly trying to navigate this, this adult world of what's allowed and what's not allowed and, and the kind of odd geography of this space. Um, and I think, in a way, I, I think she feels like her grandfather is, has not sugar-coated things and has given her you know, a glimpse into the chaos of that adult space. Um, we, we all, sorry. No, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, we also, I mean, I think this is self-evident in, in the reason why we didn't really talk about it, but we're literally on the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, you can see Juarez from the building that the dental office is housed in, you know. And so there's clearly like spatial things and like what's proper and improper um, according to, you know, white America versus non-white America, uh, particularly in the character of the grandfather. Yeah, and I mean, a, a funny thing that we also haven't talked about that like it's very live um, when you're reading this story is, you know, grandpa is someone who, you know, he's, he's this maverick, like tell it like it is kind of character. Um, he's got like this truth telling authentic quality about him. And his fake teeth are authentic. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I mean, even as he's doing something, it's a little bit, you know, about replacing the real with something fake. Um, the fake looks so real and more real somehow. Yeah. <laughs> um, it gives his granddaughter this feeling. <laughs> Here I am with these fake real teeth. Yeah. Um, I think that's a great note to end on. Um, thank you too for navigating the authenticity of odd geographies uh, with me on this day when the weather is so fine and the animals are so rambunctious in the background. <laughs> Indeed, thanks Adam. Thanks Adam. Mm -hmm.